as Greg said, I'd like to talk about uh, using Spark and especially um, with respect to data science. And first to just uh, get a sense of um, uh, the crowd, could I ask first, could you raise your hand if you've used Spark before? Okay, so some people. Could um, you raise your hand if you're uh, familiar with either Python, PyData, or our tools? Cool. Okay, so this should be accessible to uh, people who are not familiar with Spark, and I'll do like little demos so you can see what it's like. Um, but also, if you have used it before, I hope it'll be uh, especially informative in terms of what we're keeping in mind to make Spark more useful for data scientists. So yeah, as said about me, uh, I work as an Apache Spark committer at Databricks. Uh, my background is machine learning, um, but now a lot of my work is uh, basically in helping the community to build a Spark. And I'll get into the details about that community, which is really large and growing a bit later. So if you haven't used Spark before, hopefully you've at least heard about it, but I'll give a quick uh, sort of two minute intro. Um, so it's a, at a very abstract level, a general engine for distributed computing. Uh, first, one of its goals is to be fast. And you know it's commonly cited as like 10 to 100 times faster than Hadoop, depending on the workload. But the idea is um, it does things like caching in memory or spilling to disk as needed. Uh, being smart about how it shuffles data, uh, being more efficient at iterative computation, which is especially relevant for data science. We also try to make it easy to use. Uh, we try to have simple APIs uh, in multiple languages, Python, Scala, Java, and R. Um, but even though it's easy to get started, we also try to be able to support sophisticated analytics, uh, both via sort of canned algorithms and via a simple programming model so you can build your own algorithms. And finally, critical thing is that it's an Apache open source project, meaning um, even though it started at uh, Berkeley as a research project, now it's grown to include many, many contributors. And it's been critical for driving its various components. On top of sort of this core Spark distributed computing layer, uh, there are higher level libraries. Spark SQL, uh, streaming, MLlib, GraphX, um, and I'll get a bit more into these later. So this gives you at a very high level what Spark is aiming for. Um, and I'll give one slide just to tell you about Databricks, the company I work at. Uh, it was founded by the creators of Spark out of Berkeley uh, and still leading its development. Uh, what we do is offer a hosted service running Spark on EC2. Um, offering a number of things. Uh, high level, nice GUIs such as notebooks you're familiar with from, say, R. Um, here's an example notebook where I'm running a SQL query, doing a little visualization, looking at mobile device data plotted um, on a map. Uh, we have some built in visualizations and also allow you to use custom tools uh, you may be familiar with, like ggplot or matplotlib. We also do things such as cluster management. Uh, if you've ever tried to spin up a very large cluster on your own and configure it and so on, using it in production, there can be a lot of complications, and we try to help simplify that. Uh, and finally, we offer production tools such as REST APIs uh, and scheduled jobs. So at any rate, that gives you an idea of where I'm coming from. But what I'd like to talk about today are sort of this rundown. First, what are the challenges which data scientists face? Next, a more detailed overview of Spark, including the programming model and those higher level AP, um, libraries. Look at a case study uh, of music recommendation, where this will give you a bit more detailed and technical of a sense of things you might keep in mind as you start using Spark and scaling it up in production. Uh, and finally, I'll mention uh, the Spark and MLlib roadmap, especially with respect to data scientists. So first, let's just quickly mention some challenges. So a common thing to mention first is that data scientists need to be able to look at complex, messy data. You know, could be missing data, could be bad values, could just not be very well structured. You know, logs pouring in from some system not planned for your use case. 
It's often important to be able to do iterative analysis, being able to, say, run a query, get results, realize you need to modify your query, reiterate. It's important to be able to construct complex workflows. After you have explored the data, you might actually have built out a long pipeline, taking your initial data from multiple sources, munging out different features, maybe running machine learning algorithms or complex SQL queries on them. And being able to manage these workflows is critical. Next challenge is, say, moving from exploration to production. After you have worked out a workflow like this, and you want to actually productionize it, that step can often be difficult. And finally, it's very common, both in um, what you learn in school or classes and so on, uh, to work on smaller data sets you know, on your laptop. And there's a cognitive sort of gap trying to jump from there to running on a 100 or 1,000 node cluster. And so there are a number of these challenges for data scientists. And what I hope to do is mention ways in which Spark and MLlib are trying to address some of these and make it easier for users. So I'd say a high level goal um, for what I'll discuss here is to make big data more accessible via an intuitive programming model in distributed computing, uh, plus a set of ready, uh, ready to go tools. And some things I want to sort of mention, watch out for as I go through this and go through demos, is that the same code and workflows can work in both, both locally uh, and in the distributed case. We try in Spark to aim in the various language APIs to have very familiar APIs to those users, familiar concepts uh, and algorithms. And this is especially critical in machine learning where there are some very standard important algorithms. We try to provide both sort of plug and play tools as well as the possibility to do extensions and packages. Also really critical to this audience, I think, is integration with Python, PyData, and R tools. And finally, I think that uh, on the other side of that integration is what Spark offers in terms of working with production environments and tooling. Cool, so that kind of gives a sense of some of the challenges I want to keep in mind. Uh, but next I'll go into a Spark overview. So the very general programming model for Spark uh, was originally based on RDDs, or Resilient Distributed Datasets. Uh, so you can think of these sort of word by word. First, the data can be pretty much anything, you know, text, feature vectors, images, so on. These are distributed across a cluster, although it can also be simulated on a laptop. And most importantly, uh, as you scale up, they're resilient. In other words, they're rebuilt upon failure. If, say, one of your worker nodes in your cluster dies or stops communicating for a little while, um, the data which was lost can be reconstructed efficiently. And so the idea behind Spark is to program via transformations and aggregations on RDDs. So I'm going to do a quick demo, but hope that I um, can quickly just sort of like give you an idea of what to think of in terms of what's going on. So this will be a really simple demo of text mining. We'll start by loading text into memory. Uh, we'll interactively search for patterns. And later on, we'll get to machine learning after I talk a bit about MLlib. Um, but I'll first run locally on my laptop and then on a compute cluster like this where I have a driver node and then several workers, each of which holds some block of my data. Great. So please say in the back if uh, you can't hear or uh, see. So. What I'm doing is just in a terminal locally on my laptop. I have uh, a sp what's called a Spark shell. And I'll be using Python, uh, but there's also ones uh, in other languages. Um, great. And I'm going to copy a file path in so I don't forget it. But OK, pardon the messed up text. It's zoomed in. Um, but what I've done here is copy just a file path in, 
And then what I'll do is say SQL context, which is sort of a good starting point for loading data in Spark. And I'm going to read it using a format, JSON, um, and i will load it from this specific file path. So what this is doing is just looking at my uh, laptop hard drive and loading this data frame. And what this data frame is, if you uh, are from a machine learning background, is uh, you'll recognize the 20 news groups data set, very classic uh, data set to look at. Um, and so what this looks like is we have 11,000 postings uh, on news groups. And um, we could, for example, say, print the schema of our data to get a sense of what it looks like. It's very simple. It has a single column of type string, which is the text of that posting. Uh, but what this lets us do is things such as um, data frame like queries. Here what we're doing is taking the data and saying, let's filter to find where the text includes the word motorcycle and count. So there are 614 uh, news group postings, which include the word motor motorcycle. And we could uh, maybe take the first one of these uh, and see what it looks like. Uh, someone looking to buy a motorcycle. Cool. So what have I done here? Well, I've loaded data into um, a Spark construct. Here it's local. But if I copy the same text onto a cluster, it will be distributed. And then I can run some simple queries. Now, what I'd like to do is see about actually running this on uh, a cluster. So what I have here is um, a cluster set up. It, it's pretty small. I think I have four workers. Um, and uh, this is running in uh, the Databricks product, but everything I run here can basically be run uh, locally on your laptop or on your own cluster. So what I'll start with is copying in uh, the correct file path I need to load stuff from. And great. OK, so what I have here is uh, a different text data set, where here I have a sample of Amazon reviews just scraped from the Amazon website. Uh, and, but I can use the same SQL context.read. etc. And then I can do queries such as data.count. And OK, so I have some uh, 200,000 reviews here. But one thing I haven't done yet is cache this data. Now, in this case, it's a very small data set, so it's quite quick. Um, let's try to make it a little bit larger. So I have another copy um, with some 2 million reviews. And you can imagine uh, reading. OK, this is too fast. <laughs> um, it's possible. What I want to demonstrate was that it's important to um, cache this from before uh, in order to um, be able to run subsequent queries later. But what I think has happened is that I was just testing out this demo, and it's already cached. Um, but the idea in Spark is so that. How long did it take the first time you did it? I don't know. Several seconds, though. It was like, is noticeable. That's yeah. <laughs> um, But you could do things such as like um, a similar kind of display on the data. Um, we're here. Uh, you can see, for example, we have a rating or a view. And what I'm trying to show off, essentially, is that you can do very simple interactive queries uh, quickly using familiar concepts like filtering, um, looking for words such as like great, which appears in half a million reviews, and so on. Later on, we'll get to more interesting things uh, like machine learning. Well, when you cache this, the whole thing is in the memory. When you cache it. So when you, yeah, when you cache the data, um, the question is, is it all loaded into the memory? And they're really, if you just call cache, then Spark will try to persist all of that data in the memory. There are, uh, there's another command called persist, which lets you decide, you know, persist it just on disk or just in memory or some combination and other options like that. 
<coughs> is it distributed between the four clusters already by itself? Or? Yeah, the question was, is it distributed among the, uh, the four workers in the cluster? And that really depends on how you've stored it. Here, I'm loading it from an S3 bucket in Amazon S3, and I've pre-partitioned it into, I think, 16 partitions or something. So it will automatically like distribute those among the workers. But if you have only one partition, you may need to manually repartition it, um, which can be done with just like data dot repartition, you know, 16 or whatever. Um, cool. So that gives you a sense of what is being run and, or what can be done and the uh, types of simple queries you can do. Uh, and the thing I was trying to demonstrate was that it is often important to think about where data are cached. So the Spark programming model aims to provide sort of simple intuitive operations which hide the complexity of, of distributed computing. You know, that data was being loaded to different workers. I was running queries on it, uh, such as filter, which could be mapped out to those workers. And then when I did aggregation, such as um, taking the first item and the results, uh, that was being brought back to the master. But it's tried, uh, we try to hide it behind simple APIs. Yeah, I also wanted to emphasize here that you can test on a laptop, which is really important for development and debugging. Uh, and then copy that same code and use it on a cluster. But for performance, if you get into Spark and start using it, it's important to understand a few things which I'll mention here. First, local versus distributed operations. Um, there is a command which is very useful but uh, can make people unhappy called collect, which collects all your data to the driver node. And that's important if, say, you want to collect all your data or a subset of your data and print it out. But of course, keep in mind, when you're running on a 100 node cluster, you want to be careful about what you're collecting to a master node. Um, caching is really critical. Here it was a small example, and I think already cached. But um, the idea is that uh, it's important, if possible, to cache in memory. If that's not possible, to try to cache um, if you're going to hit data multiple times with many queries on both uh, memory and disk. And then finally, it's important to think about when data are shuffled. In particular, when you start using complex data frame or SQL queries uh, with, say, joins, um, it's important to think about when data are being shuffled across the network. So Spark has been used uh, a lot in production. Um, there's some now, you know, 1,000 production users. We've um, heard about clusters up to 8,000 nodes uh, and a lot of recognizable companies. Cool. So now that I've given like, that sort of background about what Spark is aiming for, um, I want to mention some more details about the various elements of it, the core higher level libraries, packages, and the community. And I'll try to go through this quickly because I'd really like to emphasize some of the more recent development uh, related to data science. Cool. So we have Spark Core, which we just looked at. Um, and then built on top of it are some higher level libraries, which I'll go through. Spark SQL is essentially for working with structured data. Um, that means data frame like queries, if you're familiar with R, uh, SQL queries if you're coming from that realm. Um, and also, importantly, especially for me with uh, data science, uh, are working with many data sources. So they're sort of built in and also external uh, support for many types of data sources, you know, JSON, CSV, Parquet, Avro, and so on. The next library built on top of Spark is streaming which allows for real-time processing via a distributed mini-batch setup. Uh, it provides very strong guarantees exactly once if, you're, uh, if you've worked with streaming before. And another nice thing is that the types of queries you can run are very similar to the batch API. It supports both general stream processing where you can you know, run whatever queries you like as well as some uh, pre sort of available algorithms, uh, such as online machine learning. Uh, 
also importantly, there's support for multiple data sources, uh, Kafka, Flume, HDFS, or S3, Kinesis, Twitter, and so on. Uh, the next library, which is what I work on the most, uh, is MLlib for distributed machine learning. It has both standard ML algorithms as well as ML, what I'll call infrastructure and utilities, um, as well as many integrations with Spark SQL and streaming. Um, and by integrations, I think the critical ones to mention are that we can take data frames, um, which you can run SQL queries on, uh, but we can take them in MLlib as data sets. Uh, and then there are, of course, streaming ML algorithms. We try to cover uh, some of the most important algorithms. Uh, the general areas are classification, regression, recommendation, clustering, uh, association rules. But there are also some what I'll call utilities or infrastructure, such as feature extraction, basic statistics in a distributed setting, linear algebra, both local and distributed. Um, and what we aim for here is to have these be quite efficient if running on your laptop, but m most critically when you need to scale up uh, to be able to scale up to a big cluster quite painlessly. The final library, which I think is uh, uh, very interesting, but maybe um, a bit more complex to think about, so I won't have much time to describe it, but is graph processing. Um, but this, too, is built on the same uh, RDD API, uh, which I mentioned before, supporting distributed graphs. Um, there's important, there are important optimizations for working with graphs, such as data co-partitioning. Um, but for users, this allows both very complex general graph processing, as well as standard graph algorithms you'll have heard of, you know, PageRank, the Pregel API, label propagation, and so on. Cool, so that gives you an idea of what these higher level libraries available are. I also want to mention something which is really critical for data scientists, I believe, which is Spark packages. Uh, and essentially, it's, well, what's said there, a community index of packages for Apache Spark. And this is just a screenshot of the web page. Uh, but you can see different um, sort of different categories of packages uh, which are starting to grow especially machine learning and data sources. And I think these are especially critical. These include things like, say, Avro Data Source for Spark SQL, reading in a, in a data frame. Um, things like Thunder for large-scale neural data analysis with Spark. There's also one I should have added up here, which is cool, very recent, on geospatial libraries. Uh, and that's just at sparkpackages.org. Cool. The final thing I want to mention about uh, Spark is the community, which has been, of course, critical for its development. Um, this is looking at Spark releases, which happen every three months, and just the number of commits. And you can see it's steadily growing with uh, about 2,000 commits in the last release, 1.5. If you sum up individual contributors, it's getting close to 1,000. And all this development is happening freely available online. Discussions happen on JIRA. Code additions are uh, on get, done on GitHub via pull requests. And the code is the latest code is always available on GitHub. There are also both user and dev mailing lists, which are really helpful. Uh, and there are also a lot of meetups. And I'm listing here this website, SparkHub, which, where we do try to maintain uh, a large list of Spark uh, meetups whenever we hear about them. Uh, question. Yes. I've heard that uh, Spark has one of the largest amounts of contribution of any Apache project. Is that true? Uh, that is true, yes. It's, I, I believe it's the most active Apache project. I, I believe it's also the most active open source big data project. Um, but yeah, it's because of the community that we've been able to grow, grow this quickly. Yes? Is it uh, otherwise uh, Apache mount? Is Apache mount going to use uh, Spark? Or? Uh, the question was, um, what about Apache Mahout, and is that planning on using Spark? And my answer was, uh, I believe there's an effort to uh, provide a DSL based on Apache Spark to try to uh, rewrite some of those algorithms um, based on Spark rather than Hadoop. Um, but I'm blanking on the name of that 
project. Have to look it up later. It looked like you were running a, a Spark back notebook when you were doing your demo. I was. Oh, so th that notebook was, um, it, it was in uh, the company Databricks' um, product, which is, yeah, providing things like notebooks, jobs, and so on. Uh, but it was backed on EC2. Um, so if we flip back to it, uh, this is a notebook you know, um, which you'd be familiar with coming from, say, IPython or R, um, similar behavior. But it's a, you can see it's like attached to this cluster called Demo Joseph. And uh, yeah, the, it, it's just a four node cluster running on EC2. Can you run that on, your, on a laptop as well? Or? Right. So I had run similar code uh, on my laptop previously, um, just in the Spark shell. Uh, which is provided with the uh, downloads of Spark. Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, cool. So now I'd like to get into uh, data science with Spark. And in particular, yes, some recent developments which have been uh, really helpful in this domain. Data frames, pipelines, Python and R, and model export and import. Uh, and I want to especially emphasize like integrations with PyData and R tools familiar APIs for those users, uh, and also steps towards productionizing Spark uh, to facilitate that. So hopefully you're familiar with data frames, especially if you attended the morning tutorial. Uh, but um, essentially, the concept is as you'd expect, data grouped into named columns. Um, here, there's department, age, and name. Um, where they could have different types, you know, strings, integers, and so on. And we can run simple queries, such as, say, group by department, take the average of the age in each department. This is the other part of data frames, which I think is really critical for users, a DSL for common tasks, you know, projection, filtering, aggregation, and so on. There's some 100 plus functions available, uh, support for metadata, and also user-defined functions, so you can tailor your queries. And these have both local and distributed forms, where the distributed one uh, is backed by RDDs, so it, it gains that resiliency. Uh, so data frames with Python and R. So here's the syntax for uh, this query in Scala and Java um, and Python. So we try to have similar APIs among those languages. R is a bit different, and uh, people are used to slightly different APIs. Um, so we tried to make the data frame API uh, familiar to people who have used R data frames. We also provide integrations with these libraries via conversions. If you have a Spark data frame, distributed or local, uh, with a single call, you can convert to and from Python Pandas, uh, a local data frame, um, or a local R data frame. The other element of data frames I want to mention are the optimizations. So here's a plot just of a, a small query run on a single machine. But the point being, first, if you compare the RDD and the data frame, data frame in green, implementations, the time to aggregate uh, a million int pairs um, was much smaller with data frames. And this is odd because data frames are just using RDDs. But the reason here is that there's query optimization going on with a Catalyst optimizer. So it's taking this very simple query and still able to convert it into a significantly faster one. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that with the RDD API, there are runtime differences between different languages. But with data frames, there's a unified implementation. Uh, so you no longer take that performance hit when you use, say, Python. Uh, and I will also mention, in case you've heard of it, there's a project called Tungsten, which is, again, for optimizations. Uh, I won't have time to go into it, but it's stepping outside of JVM memory management in order to get much closer to sort of bare metal running times. Cool. So the next element I want to talk about are, uh, is ML pipelines. And the idea is to think about what an ML workflow might look like. You know, at a very high level, you might load data, get features, train a model, evaluate it. But of course, in practice, this can often be much more complex. 
You might have a bunch of data sources to extract features. You might have many different steps. You might not just train one model, but multiple ones, then ensemble them before you evaluate. Basically, it can get complex. So what ML pipelines are trying to do is simplify the API and the workflow for uh, users who have complex tasks. But I'll, I'll explain this via a, a fairly simple workflow, where the task will be, given text, we want to predict the sentiment. So we're going to start by loading data, um, where we'll just use, say, the data sources for data frames. So after we've loaded that, I'm going to explain this via the data schema, by which I mean after we load the data, we have a data frame with two columns, a label, which, say, indicates sentiment, you know, one is bad, five is good, um, text, um, which may be, say, an Amazon review. And then we're going to extract features. So for this step, um, I'll explain it using some simple um, featureizers you may be familiar with. Tokenizer is going to break text into different words. And so what this transformation will do is simply add a new column to our schema where we now have a column called words, which just includes a sequence of, of words rather than them all in the single text string. Hash term frequency is uh, basically a featureizer, which will take these words and hash them to a feature vector. Uh, term frequency is just a reweighting, uh, text specific reweighting. Um, but what this will give us is a feature vector, which will be very understandable for machine learning algorithms. I'm highlighting these in blue because they fit uh, what in the ML pipelines API is called a transformer. And the idea of a transformer is it takes one data frame and produces another. In this case, that producing another simply means appending a new column uh, to that data frame. But there could be more general transformations. So for training a model, uh, we're going to use, say, I meant to write this as linear regression, but uh, you get the idea. Um, I think these are old slides. Um, so l l what we're going to do is try to take uh, the label and the features columns and learn a function taking the feature column and using that to predict the label. And after we've trained that model, uh, we can add a new column um, to our schema, which includes the prediction for each row in our data set. Uh, this is red, fitting the estimator uh, concept in the pipelines API, which will take a data frame, train on it, and produce a model. And finally, we can evaluate. So evaluation is going to take the label column and the prediction column, compare them, and say how well we did. So this is the final concept in the pipelines API, an evaluator. It takes a data frame and produces some metric saying how well you did. In this case, just comparing uh, these two predictions. So uh, I'll mention one thing, which is by default, we're always appending new columns. Uh, this is useful in that you can, at the end, you have a data frame with all of your intermediate results. So you can go back and inspect them. Um, this sounds expensive, keeping all this around. But actually, it's not, because it's made efficient by data frames. You essentially contain in the data frame a way to construct that data, but don't necessarily have to materialize it except when you need it. Uh, the final thing which I'll do is uh, say, here I've been talking about a workflow, but I haven't actually said what a, quote, pipeline is. What a pipeline will do is wrap the critical part of this workflow, uh, the feature extraction and the model training. And what this will let us do, you know, very simply, is simply take new data and rerun uh, the workflow on that new data in the same way. This is sort of the first benefit of pipelines, a nice API like this. The other element, which is critical to people starting to work with machine learning, is parameter tuning. Uh, so I hadn't mentioned this, but you know, of course, many of these elements could contain parameters where if you adjust them, it significantly impacts uh, the prediction performance. 
So logistic regressions, regularization parameter, uh, is one of those. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, basically it prevents you from fitting too, too well on your training data and then doing badly on new test data. So adjusting this parameter uh, based on your particular problem is critical. You could also imagine this hash term frequency thing was producing a set uh, uh, of, ve of vectors representing our text. But we may not know if we need 100 numbers to represent a document or 1,000 numbers to rec represent a document. So we might want to tune that. We provide sort of a built-in way of doing this via grid search, uh, via a method or a class called cross-validator, which when given an estimator like this pipeline, a parameter grid to sweep over, and an evaluator to tell us how well uh, each um, set of parameters is doing, it'll automatically find the best parameters. Uh, so let me demonstrate this really quickly. Cool. So let me um, resume here. And uh, cool. So we have this data set, which has what? Uh, Two million instances. Um, just quickly, I'm going to uh, actually reload a slightly smaller one just to make this. I, I think I'm running. Uh, shorter on time than expected. Um, so I'm loading uh, one with 200,000 uh, rows. And then I'm going to construct a pipeline. So this is sort of the critical part of constructing that workflow. Uh, we have a tokenizer, um, that hashing TF step to create a feature vector. We have our linear regression model, not logistic. Uh, because we want to treat the rating of the Amazon review as a real number. Uh, and then we're stringing these elements together in a pipeline. Um, and here I'm appending uh, the name Spark just to really emphasize that these are uh, Spark uh, classes. So what this will be doing uh, is iterating through uh, these various stages um, of feature transformation and model training but now it's canned in the single pipeline. I'll define a parameter grid, which in this case is going to be very simple. <laughs> We're just going to iterate over two parameters um, and choose the best one. I'll define an evaluation metric, which if you're familiar with it is R squared. If you're not, basically it's a metric between 0 and 1, where closer to 1 is better. And then finally, uh, we can do cross-validation. Let me zoom in here. So our estimator, again, is our pipeline. We define an evaluator. And we're sweeping over this parameter grid. Cool. So after we um, define this workflow, we can simply call fit on our data set. And so what this is doing is for each fold of cross-validation, uh, for each parameter we want to test, uh, it's fitting a model, seeing how well it does. And at the end, it'll return the best model. Uh, so what you can see here is that a bunch of jobs are running. And these are basically steps in uh, the pipeline. They may be feature transformations. They may, may be steps of linear regression. Um, but one thing I'll point out to Spark users uh, is that it's really critical once you have you know, gotten into Spark, if you want to optimize performance, to understand the Spark UI, which gives you a very detailed view into what's going on with Spark. So OK, it's done, but let me finish this. Um, where here, uh, for example, this is saying we have a number of jobs, uh, different stages. We could examine, for example, uh, the different RDDs, which are being stored, and how much are cached. There are a lot of elements we can look at here, including, say, the executors. Here I have four plus the driver. And you can get a sense of, for example, how much memory is being used in each of these. Uh, so I would highly recommend, if you start using Spark, to just explore this and get a sense of what's going on. Cool. So after we fit our model, we could say uh, load in a test data set 
And here, it's uh, actually going to be a significantly larger, um, just because the transformation step uh, is um, quite efficient. And this lets me show off uh, Spark. So here, what I'm doing is calling evaluate on the predictions. And this model, uh, this cross-validation model, which I fit, is essentially using the best pipeline we found, transforming the test data into a predictions data frame, and evaluating it. Um, cool. And so at the end, we can see we got you know, this R squared score. And if we were doing this for real, what we would do is do many more folds of cross-validation, maybe many more parameters we'd sweep over, and we could see how that could improve. But this gives you an idea of the sort of workflow you can find. And if you're coming from, say, scikit-learn, this should be familiar. There's the concept of pipelines, transformers, and so on. Um, and that was our intent, to make it a familiar stepping stone to uh, move to these distributed workflows. All right. So the ending points I'll say for ML pipelines are that, one, we try to store data in data frames. Uh, the main concepts are transformer, estimator, and evaluator. And we try to provide automated parameter tuning. There are other things I won't have time for, such as um, allowing you to inspect intermediate results. There's schema vali validation, which basically runs the pipeline with metadata which is quick to see if it will fail um, before actually doing the expensive thing of running it with your data. Um, there's support for complex pipelines. This was a really simpler, simple like three-step linear pipelines, but you can actually compose things. You can have a pipeline within a pipeline within a cross-validator. You can have directed acyclic graphs and so on. And you can also have user-defined components. So you could define your own estimator uh, or model or evaluator. Cool. So that gives you a sense of what we're aiming for with ML pipelines and brings me to a next section on Python and R. So, oh, yes. Now, regarding this pipeline, you are trying to do sentiment analysis, right? That's right. So, where is your dictionary for that? I mean, what is. Yeah, let me. I should have done this at the end. Let, thanks for asking. Um, the question was, uh, this is, was supposed to be sentiment analysis. Um, so like, what's the meaning of that in this uh, context? So here I'm looking at um, the Amazon data set, but on the predictions. So it includes both the original data uh, and the predictions being made. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on in this, but all I was looking at really was the review, uh, which is text. And we're trying to use that to predict the rating. Um, this rating is uh, just a number between 1 and 5. And um, there are a lot of other columns. We, uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I think I swept back accidentally. Um, there are a lot of other columns, but to simplify this, let me just select, um, say, the review, uh, the rating, and then our prediction. Um, How many records cool. were there in the training set that were lazy? Uh, in the training set, it was the 200,000 oh. one. Um, so here we have different reviews. Um, ratings uh, and predictions. And you can see, like, at least on these, it's somewhere. But of course, in reality, you would actually do more effort, make more effort to model tune and, and stuff, but not in a quick demo. Um, but that's the idea, to be able to then take new text and predict the sentiment there. Are they happy with the item? Or are they not? Cool. Sure. OK, so in Python and R APIs, um, I just wanted to mention first, the Python API has been around a lot longer. Um, it's long established. Um, one important thing to mention is that with RDDs, um, there were complaints that Python was slow. With data frames, um, same implementation, 
uh, so you get performance parity. Uh, and the same thing for performance parity for our data frames, which were added in Spark 1.4. Uh, in 1.5, we added the first machine learning support in R uh, for generalized linear models, where you can basically use R syntax using R formula uh, in order to call in to the underlying distributed Scala implementation. Uh, so the one thing I will mention here is that, yeah, these APIs are wrappers for Scala implementations. And what this allows us to do is, one, to have much faster development rather than re-implementing in each language. And also, it's important to note that it means that these new APIs are actually often very well tested. They're calling into the Scala APIs, which have been around for many releases and are already in production in many cases. Uh, the final thing I wanted to mention, which is really important for taking that final step to production, is model export and import. And the goals are to save the model to reload later, say if you want to do more training or whatever, or if you want to export it to production. Uh, so there are two methods for exporting uh, in MLlib. Uh, the first is the Spark native export and import using JSON metadata and Parquet model data. Um, the point of these is that they are distributed formats to allow us to support very large scale models. Uh, we have coverage for most of the models, uh, plus initial work on exporting entire pipelines coming in the next release. Then also critically, as Greg had mentioned, predictive model markup language is arguably one of the industry standards for uh, exporting models. It's a local XML-based format, um, and it's very important uh, in many production use cases. So Spark has initial support for this, and we hope to expand it. Um, currently, for linear models like linear regression, logistic regression, and so on, uh, as well as for k-means clustering. Cool. So with that, I'd like to, uh, in the remaining minutes, um, mention a case. Yes. OK. <laughs> I think that's good. Um, mention a little case study and music recommendation with the idea that gives you a taste of what it's like to implement a distributed algorithm uh, or to use it and, and know how to start tuning it. So uh, this is a case study on a Spotify data set, just a subset of their data, uh, with about five, uh, uh, 50 million users, uh, 30 million songs, and 50 billion ratings. And yeah, thanks very much to Spotify for uh, help with this and allowing this to go public. Um, so the idea is, yeah, we want to recommend songs to users. And the algorithm we're going to do or use is alternating least squares, or ALS. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I'll explain it a bit, or the intuition. But the idea is that we phrase this problem as follows. We have a big matrix, users by songs. We may have an entry in this matrix, say three stars, indicating that this user was pretty happy with his song. Um, and really, we'll have a lot of this data, you know, 50 billion ratings. Um, and what I want to emphasize is that there are many missing entries in this matrix. And that's really the info we need in order to make recommendations. You know, a user knows which songs they like if they've heard them. But if they haven't heard or rated them, we need to be able to infer that. So take, for example, this top row, middle column. Um, we don't know the rating there. So we'd like to fill this in. And the way we're going to fill it in is by phrasing this problem as matrix factorization. Um, if you're not familiar with matrix factorization, pay more attention to how data are going to be distributed, which I'll mention in a moment. So we have this matrix, the blue box. And matrix factorization is going to say this is equal to the matrix product of, first, the user factors, which I'm representing as this matrix, which is essentially, for each user, um, a few numbers, you know, which may not be interpretable, but essentially represent that user's interests, multiplied by uh, the item or the song uh, uh, products, where this is going to be, again, 
a vector of numbers representing sort of the content of that song. And the idea is, for example, for this uh, three question marks entry, that value will be computed uh, by multiplying the vector dot product of uh, this top row of the red uh, user matrix by that middle column of the uh, song uh, matrix. And so basically, two things to note. One, this original matrix could be huge, um, but we don't really want to estimate that many parameters. So instead, we're representing the users and the songs with small vectors, small sets of numbers, which lets us significantly reduce the problem dimensionality. So here's our sort of data setup, our problem setup. What we'll first do is break the problem into chunks, which we can distribute over a cluster. Here, uh, the user and song factors are broken into different uh, uh, blocks, which will be distributed across the cluster. And then our data, the ratings that we do have, will be distributed to the corresponding elements. Um, so I'll emphasize here that this type of blocking can reduce communication, um, where rather than, say, doing some sort of all-to-all -all communication between you know, every user and every song, uh, it's important to be able to block this communication, uh, reduce duplicate uh, communication across the network, and so on. The other thing is data locality. And here, in this case, it means caching relevant ratings at corresponding user or song blocks. Now, these kinds of things are important if you're implementing an algorithm, um, but less so if, say, you're just going to use the implementation of ALS. But they do translate to some lessons for users. First, when you're tuning, say, an algorithm like ALS, and in this case, for us, it was important to adjust the number of partitions or blocks uh, and in particular, for ML algorithms, we often recommend to set the number of partitions in your data about equal to the number of compute cores. So you know, if you have four machines with eight cores each, maybe use 32 partitions. Um, and that's different from other parts of Spark, where it's often good to use many more partitions. Uh, and the reason is that many machine learning algorithms um, really take uh, just become uh, significantly more efficient with the same number of partitions as cores, partly because jobs take similar amounts of time for ML algorithms often, uh, and because some of this blocking helps reduce communication. It's also important to monitor caching. Uh, and this is a link to the Spark docs on that Spark UI I was showing you earlier, where you could look at each of your executors, your workers, see how much data they're caching, and so on. So after some tuning like this, uh, we got some results. And this is on this uh, Spotify sample data with 50 billion ratings. It was run on 32 uh, Amazon EC2, our 3.8x large nodes, uh, using spot instances. So for rank 10 factorization, rank 10 meaning the number of uh, values we use to represent each user in each song, um, 10 iterations got you know, a reasonable answer, and it took about an hour. The cost in total was about $10 for, per hour. Um, and so this was pretty cool, being able to process um, this large chunk of their data uh, for a very, very low cost. Cool. So finally, to wrap up, I just want to mention the Spark and MLib roadmap, especially with respect to data science. So for data frames, which I had mentioned, the API, I think, is largely there, although there's some exciting work on a data set API, which um, we'll be ready to talk about before long. But uh, is this ongoing project, Tungsten, which I had mentioned before, stepping outside the JVM in order to improve performance. So basically, what you should expect to see with data frames in the coming releases is significantly improved performance. And that'll be both locally on your laptop and on clusters. For ML pipelines, I think the basic API is there. Um, the main thing missing is that not all of the MLlib algorithms have been integrated with data frames and pipelines. And so filling out this 
uh, API uh, is something which will be critical. And finally, there are some performance optimizations we can make, especially for parameter tuning, um, such as warm starts, uh, sharing uh, m model data from uh, the previous run of cross-validation with, say, the next, and so on. Spark R, uh, essentially, the main goal I'd like is to expand ML algorithm coverage. Right now, there are generalized linear models, but we'd like to make others available. And then finally, expanding model and pipeline export and import uh, to PMML and our native format. Um, cool. So the things I mentioned, uh, which I want to leave you with, are that we try to emphasize familiar APIs, concepts, and algorithms for data scientists coming from PyData and R. We try to provide plug and play tools plus extensions and packages, as well as integration with your uh, familiar Python and R, R tools. And finally, what Spark itself has long provided is integration with production environments and tooling. So these slides will be, I guess, uh, on the video and also uh, available later. Um, but there are some links to resources. Um, go to the Spark page, spark.apache.org, for a download and documentation, as well as Spark packages to get started. There's a big community with mailing lists available from the spark.apache.org page, uh, meetups, uh, and so on. And as far as learning more about this um, in a more um, facilitated setting, uh, one thing I do want to mention um, are MOOCs on edX, which are uh, basically co-taught between Databricks and, um, uh, Databricks and UC Berkeley. Uh, where we had previously offered an intro to Spark and a machine learning on Spark course, we're going to reoffer those as well as more advanced versions. Uh, and finally, I didn't have much time to really demo the Databricks product, uh, but you saw a glimpse of at least the notebook aspect. Um, but you could sign up for a free trial at databricks.com. Uh, and with that, I'll leave an outline, and thank you very much. Yeah, the question was, does the recommender alternatingly squares fit into the pipelines API? And uh, that one is available in pipelines, yes. So you can pass it a data frame. Yes? Right. Yeah, the question was about using Zeppelin, which is a, a, a Spark notebook, um, or a notebook where you can access Spark. And yes, you, you are able to hook that up. I, I actually haven't used it myself, but it is a familiar notebook concept, which you can hook up to, a, to, to Spark. Yeah. Is there any of the features that you presented for a particular version of Spark? I want to work on that. Let's see. So some of. Uh, a number of the ones I mentioned were, in particular, the you know like the R API um, that was introduced initially in 1.4 and extended in 1.5. Um, pipelines have been available since, I believe, 1.2. Although I I think they really only expanded a lot in 1.4. Um, other things I presented. Yeah. So the demo I did I think would work in 1.2 or 1.3. Um, but uh, there certainly is like greater and greater coverage um, in pipelines and later releases. Yeah. Question. Yeah. What were some of the optimizations happening in that tungsten project you mentioned? Oh, sure. So optimizations in tungsten. Um, so what tungsten is doing is um, actually first I should say Scala compiles to the JVM. So you, you're, if you're familiar with, say, Java garbage collection and memory management, um, there are sometimes complaints about it having you know, some big overhead, lots of time collecting uh, garbage, rather than actually doing the computation. 
And that can be avoided in languages, say, like C++, where you, you know, explicitly do your own memory management. So what Tungsten is doing is using some Java uh, APIs, which allow you to basically do your own memory management. And that avoids thing that lets you, say, avoid garbage collection. And also, it gives us like, much more control over how memory is used uh, to provide other efficiencies. So there is IBIS on the roadmap, and you also have vo 4 j which will do the uh, RAP database also on top of it. The pattern you see is that you have distributed machine, and you can leverage different types of workloads that you can run on the hard disk machine. Can Spark actually create a library that people can just use it to have distributed computing and do sophisticated workloads on Hmm. So, let, I guess I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is uh, so? What kind of I guess API were you? So I'm hoping that if the piece of Spark that talks to different clusters, the RDD portion of it, right? Not for machine learning, but some other things that we can actually leverage. Oh, certainly. Spark and right. Yeah. The question was, I guess, rather than say using existing things in MLlib. Can you leverage the underlying implementations for, say, cluster computing? And definitely. So, a lot of op of things can be implemented um, simply uh, using the familiar data frames API. Um, that allows you to do essentially everything that the RDDs allow. Um, RDDs can also be used directly for your own implementations. And I mean, in fact, like MLlib sits on top of that Spark core and uses um, open APIs, which uh, you could instead say, if you have your own variant of you know, linear regression, write it yourself, use those APIs, and so on. Um, so it's definitely intended to be extensible. And a lot of the big companies, uh, in addition to using the existing algorithms, have their own tailored ones. Thank you.